lives right inside. He's the way maker. He has paid the price. Well, he's the way maker. The one the lost must see. He made the way to set men, set men free. One day I was talking about how to win lost souls. The world around us is filled with fraud and woes. I could not seem to settle on what method I would try. Then the Lord said, the way maker lives inside. Well, he's the way maker. He lives right inside. Yes, he's the way maker. He has paid the price. He's the way maker. He's the one the lost must see. He has made the way to set men free. For the lost to see Jesus, we must start on bended knee. Our heart's desire must be that they'd be free. The Lord God, He is faithful. He will answer our heart's cry. Then they'll be set free. The waymaker lives inside. He's the waymaker. He lives right inside. Yes, He's the waymaker. He has paid the price. He's the waymaker. He's the one the lost must see. He has made the way to set me. God's son, who died, who rose, ascended when all was done. You know, he left us not alone. No, he said it would abide by his spirit. The way maker lives inside. He's the way maker. He lives right inside. Yes, he's the way maker. He is paid to price. Well, he's the way maker. He's a one the lost must see. He's made the way, set men, set men. Good morning, New Life Community Church. Good morning. Jeff and Steph here. We are excited that we get to bring an encouragement and a scripture to you this morning. So Steph's going to bring us some scripture. Okay, so I'm reading from James 1, 2-4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Everybody has hard times in their lives, especially now during COVID. But even before COVID, everybody goes through hard times in their lives. Uh, But the scripture tells us that these hard times are not for nothing. God is using these hard times to bring us or uh, teach us to be perseverant right That's exactly what. and so these times are hard but God is still using them to teach us and God can use them to prepare us for things that he has uh, later down the road so and our strength to persevere actually comes from the Holy Spirit so spending time in the word and in prayer and in fellowship with other believers is exactly how we persevere. What's that saying that you learned when you were young? Oh, uh, in Sunday school they taught us that if you, it's a song that so says, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Yeah. So, anyways, we are glad that we got to talk to you guys this morning and we hope that you have a great Sunday. See ya. Bye-bye. We are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He the great example is a pattern for me. Jesus has shown, sweeter far than any love that mortals have known. Kind to the erring one, faithful as he, he 
the great example is a pattern for me. Thank you to Jeff and Steph for your opening words and thank you to Ike and Frida and part of their family for the music and leading us in worship this morning. I really appreciate all the people in our congregation that let themselves be recorded and become part of these online services. I just appreciate it so much. I love this church and so thank you for that. Also, there's a few announcements. One, our old building is no longer ours. If someone out there still has a key, throw it away. Don't go in the building. It's not ours. It's off our title. Uh, so this is our building officially. There's no old church and new church. This is the church. So that's exciting and great things have been happening here. Uh, we have had so 
so many things going on and we had more volunteers this week. Abby was setting up and uh, she is getting prepared and, and gearing up for a kids ministry in the future. Uh, we had uh, Steph and Jackie here working in the kitchen, sorting, putting things away, making it presentable. And it's a big job. And uh, thank you so much for being here and doing that this week. Uh, Robert Kashmarski was here all week again, working hard. He pulled those 70-year-old furnaces out of the out of the basement, making room for the boiler. The boiler is supposed to come this week, and so that's exciting. So many good upgrades and big projects are going to be done, and this is going to be a great facility for us. And we want it to serve not only us, but the community. So let's pray to that end. Pray that God would, would work through us to bless and love our community. Let's make that part of our prayers. And also, thank you again for your, your love and your contributions uh, for Mission of the Month of May. The food that we collected came to 190 pounds, plus we still have $160 to, to spend on more food. And this is for emergency needs, so this is going to bless a lot of families in and a lot of people in emergency situations. For the month of May, for the month of May, I just said that. For the month of June, uh, we are focusing on a missions organization, uh, ERDO, uh, E-R-D-O. It's Emergency Relief and Development Overseas. And so check it out online, erdo.ca. You'll see that it is something worth contributing to. People are hungry and people are in need of shelter. And so Erdo is there. So thank you for supporting that for the month of June. If you make a contribution online or e-transfer, uh, make sure you specify what is regular giving and what is mission of the month giving. You might have to do it in two transactions if that's easier for you. I had no birthdays. I had no anniversaries on my list. So if I'm missing something, please let me know. Uh, keep in mind this week the... Wednesday study group and prayer. Um, it's via Zoom. Contact me if you need to uh, figure out the code to get in. And also the ladies study. It's on Saturday. Here's uh, information on that. So keep these things in mind. Put them in your phone. Um, we don't necessarily send out a reminder every week and so put them in your phone. Put it on repeat so that it comes up and if you're free join us. If you can't make it that's okay too, but we think uh, this is an important time. I encourage you to make the effort. Hey, your pastor's calling you. Make an effort. All right. Enough said. I should open my eyes more in these videos. Anyways, that's it for the announcements. We look forward to what God has to say in his word. Amen. Let's pray before we look into God's word. Let's pray with me. Lord, teach us this morning by your word and by your Holy Spirit. Draw us closer to you. Do the redemptive work in our hearts and minds that needs to be done. You who began a good work in us, promise to be faithful to complete it. We thank you for that. Let your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, unless you have been avoiding the news and all public media, I'm sure you've heard of the death of George Floyd, and as and you may have seen the video footage as, as well. In the United States, while a police officer was pinning George to the ground with with a neck on his with a knee on his neck um, for an extended amount of time, George um, was subdued. And then it looked like he went limp, went unconscious, and then we find out that he died still pinned to the ground by the officer's knee. Um, people on the street were, were taking video of this and they were pleading constantly for the police officer to stop or to, you know, saying that, you know, okay, he's not resisting anymore. Um, he's, he seems to be unresponsive, check on him, check on him. Um, but the police officer that had his knee on the neck of George uh, didn't move, didn't even look at George, didn't even, uh, didn't show any concern whatsoever, uh, didn't check on him, 
It's a horrible thing to watch, and it just goes on and on and on. And, uh, and you know, you're watching it, it's making you sick to the stomach, and it's like, um, I, it's obvious that, that something wasn't right. Obvious. Um, even not knowing all the facts or the backstory, because, you know, the police had been called to some scene, to some, um, something was going on there, some illegal activity. But even then, uh, even not knowing all the facts, um, there seems to be absolutely no reason for pinning down someone by the neck that long, even when they go unconscious and furthermore, not even checking on them. Uh, something just doesn't sit right there and it's, it's hard to watch. The, um, this police officer has been fired and charged with second degree murder. There was other police officers that were standing guard, keeping bystanders back, and they too did not intervene in the situation or, or check on George. And so they also have been fired and are facing charges. Um, this, this is a white police officer and a black civilian. And so this has lit up the states and people around the world regarding the racial prejudices that still exist in our world and the injustice of this whole thing. People want justice. People want change. And people are re reacting. You know, I, I have to say that it feels like I live in a bit of a bubble here in rural Saskatchewan. Uh, yet, I do know that prejudice thoughts and statements and actions exist here as well. Uh, rude comments, generalizations are made. Uh, when you hear that someone won't let a certain lab tech take their blood because of their skin color, it's like, seriously, this is happening? But it is. Someone, someone has said that we have the same issues everywhere else, but we as Canadians are more polite about it. It's like polite about prejudice. Oh, man. In light of what is happening, I want to speak to this. Uh, there have been comments such as, if a person doesn't speak up, their silence is saying something. So ignoring it won't make it go away. That, right? We know that. So we need to speak up. And as many other speakers have said already, it says, I might say it wrong. I, it may come out of me incorrectly. And, and sometimes uh, we hesitate to say anything at all because, you know, we're, we're scared we might say the wrong thing. But, you know, the, tr the truth is we, it is important that we, we're talking about it, right? We need to bring it up. We need to address it, um, not sweep it under the rug, pretend that it's not there pretend that it doesn't affect us or that it's not present in our own community. Uh, no, we need to speak to it. And of course, my question regarding justice, injustice, and prejudice is, what does God say? And as a believer, what is my responsibility? And one portion of scripture that I have been looking at, and there's, there's many that we could and maybe will in the future, um, but the one I'm looking at today is 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting at verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan, a prophet of God, to David, who was the king of Israel. When he came to David, he said, There were two men in a city. One was rich, but the other was poor. The rich man had many sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little female lamb he had bought. The poor man fed the lamb, and it grew up with him and his children, it shared his food and drank from his cup and slept in his arms. The lamb was like a daughter to him. Then a traveler stopped to visit the rich man. The rich man wanted to feed the traveler, but he didn't want to take from his own sheep or cattle. Instead, he took the lamb from the poor man and cooked it for his visitor. So Nathan told a very simple account of an injustice. A man who had so much wanted to entertain a visitor but rather take from his own bounty, he took from the man who had so little in comparison. That's got wrong written all over it, doesn't it? Now, if you were in charge like King David and heard that story, would it not make your blood boil? You know, why does a rich person have to take from a poor person? What, who does he think he is? You know, that is just cruel. It's, it's unnecessary. And we lose all respect for that rich person. We want justice. We want to see that man compensated. But even that doesn't, uh, doesn't seem like enough because the little that he had was so valuable to the poor man 
and, and cannot truly be replaced. So hearing of this, it made King David's blood boil. And as king, he wasn't going to just sit back and let that happen. He had the power to do something, and he was going to do something about it. So as we read in verse 5, David became very angry at the rich man. And he said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this should die. He must pay for the lamb four times for doing such a thing. He had no mercy. Now, does that reaction sound about right to you? David's reaction is much like our own when we see or hear an injustice. But here's the twist in the story. Verse 7. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. You see, David sinned, and the Lord had Nathan go and hold up a mirror, so to speak, to David. So David could see himself and his own sin clearly, without excuse, without some sort of self-justification filter to see himself as he was in his sin. You know, back to verse 7 and, and following, we see it continue here. It says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to David. I appointed you king of Israel and saved you from Saul. I gave you his kingdom and his wives. I made you king of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you even more. So why did you ignore the Lord's command? Why did you do what he says is wrong? You killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and took his wife to be your wife. Now there will always be people in your family who will die by the sword because you did not respect me. You took the wife of Uriah the Hittite for yourself. You can go back and read the whole story, uh, the backstory in chapter 11. But David sinned. He took something away from someone else and committed murder in the act as well. But I, I jump now to verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The light bulb goes on for David. Nathan held up the mirror and David saw his own reflection clearly. He saw his own sin clearly. You know, we are, we are good at seeing the sin of others. I mean, that's, I don't know if that's, that's just human nature, right? We're good at seeing the sin of others and we're quick to judge others. And we can be so blind to our own or, or we have justified it or we've made excuses and we're looking at it through that filter. And so it doesn't seem as bad. But let me be clear. Injustice of any kind is a sin. Racism is a sin. Not treating all with equality is a sin. Whether we're talking age or gender or race or social status. Let me point out a few things from this passage. One, God is a God of justice. Verse 1, where it says, the Lord sent Nathan. The Lord sent Nathan. The Lord sees this injustice and deals with it. There are severe consequences for David's actions. You know, it's so very clear from this and from other scriptures as well that God is a God of justice. God's very nature, character, is holiness, righteousness. And these are tied directly to, to justice, meaning that which is right or as it should be. The words and the concepts of justice and righteousness are, are used interchangeably at times. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, God's anger is shown from heaven against all the evil and wrong things people do. By their own evil lies they hide the truth. Romans chapter 2 verse 5, but you are stubborn and refuse to change. So you are making your, your own punishment even greater on the day he shows his anger. On that day everyone will see God's right judgments. Though it looks like God isn't always intervening now when we would like him to be. Uh, God may even seem distant at times. but And I don't know all the answers. But I know that God has his reasons. And we just did a study on Revelation. And it, it is very clear in the book of Revelation that judgment is coming. And a day is coming when all injustice will be dealt with. And everything will be set right. Number two, as God's people, we are to respond to injustice. Doing nothing, saying nothing, 
when we encounter an injustice is a sin. Obviously, we cannot individually take on every cause and every injustice in this world, but having that general understanding that we are to step up to the plate as God calls us and as God reveals the need, just as he called Nathan and Nathan responded. In, in the Bible, we see the widows and the orphans. They were specifically mentioned in Jesus' day as those that were overlooked, those that were mistreated. And so the Christian church was called to look after them. Uh, the Bible talks about how to respond to the hung hungry. Uh, the Bible talks about helping those that cannot defend themselves. Uh, we see that Jesus treated women respectfully in a time when they were often treated like property. We see that Jesus treated foreigners with respect, breaking socially accepted norms. Love and value is to be extended to all equally. We are all the Lord's creation after all. You now, as Nathan asked David, verse 9, So why did you ignore the Lord's command? Why did you do what he says is wrong? Which brings me to point three. It's a heart issue. We need a heart change, like a heart transplant, so to speak. It starts here. I know trying to change things with violence is not the answer. I understand the death of George and, and the injustices that are happening. They're serious and, and the people are, are frustrated and want to be heard. I understand that. But I know too that violence may put fear in people's hearts, but it does not change a person's heart for the better. We also know that you cannot make a law to change someone's heart. Uh, sure, you can make better and stronger law laws, which will help prohibit people from doing wrong actions, but it doesn't change the heart, and the prejudices will still be there, and they find a way to come out. We need that heart change, and God is able to change our heart, or give us a new heart, when we turn to Him in repentance, and turn to God, and, and follow Jesus. One uh, Turning to God makes us aware of our own sin, and he helps us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help transform us into godly people. Number four, David recognized his sin and repented. Verse 13 says, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, it's bigger than just doing wrong to another human being. Uh, David recognized that he is accountable before God himself. That's why I think David, even though he made some huge mistakes in his life, he, he ended up staying close to God. Why? Because he, he knew that he had to make peace with God. He stood before God, sin revealed, and repented. Perhaps you are seeing the two sides of this. What can we do for others to support, protect, and stand up against injustice? And what is in our own heart? Uh, can we see it? Or do we need the Holy Spirit to show us? You know, it might be something that we learn as we read God's word and we let him speak to us. Uh, it might be God sending us a Nathan in our path to correct us, to rebuke us. We need to be of a mindset um, where we can be corrected. You, you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, prepare yourself to receive rebuke. Uh, David was able to repent for a man in his position as a king. I'm king. I, I don't need to admit to anyone that I'm wrong. Might, might have been his attitude, but for King David, uh, he repented. He admitted that he was wrong. And that's, uh, that's, an, that's incredible, actually. And we may struggle with repentance. We might make excuses and, and decide just to continue as we are, not making any changes in our life. But we need to be pre preparing ourselves by realizing that God may call us out on our own sin. That we're not perfect. And we might have some wrong attitudes that might show up and rise up. And someone might correct us. And God's word might correct us. And we need to be prepared for that and respond as David did. Respond correctly in repentance. Now where does this leave us? And what can we do? You know, one of our, our pastors in our district, uh, Josh Singh, wrote an article about the church's response. So I'm going to glean from that and, and uh, share a little bit of that. As a, as a church, what can we do? One, um, it was suggested that we could do some probing and see how uh, 
other minority groups view our church? Is there something that we're not seeing, something that we are not aware of? Number two, are we involving everyone? And we're not talking about some token representative of another nation to say, hey, look, we, we represent other, other nations, other cultures. But sincerely and equally investing and training and involving everyone. You know, are we worried that so-and-so is going to be offended when, when they can't understand someone because of their accent? Number three, um, staying away from gimmicks. Our efforts need to come from a, a genuine, authentic place, personally and corporately. Number four, have those conversations. We can wait for a situation to arise or we can address it ahead of time and be prepared for when issues will arise. You know, it is biblical that all are equal in God's eyes. So this needs to be taught as the old song, Sunday school that we used to sing, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. And I used to love it when missionaries would come and expand my world. I'd hear of different languages and cultures, cultural differences. And, uh, but I'd also hear about how I have Christian brothers and sisters around the world. I mean, that, uh, that gave me a, a world perspective even as a young child. I think this was a positive thing. Uh, we can also incorporate it into our plans and policies uh, that can be part of our church protection plan and training. So people feel prepared and empowered to speak up when an issue arises. You know, having that conversation with our children and our youth, it's, a, it's best to start when they're young to value and embrace all people. So families, parents, have that conversation with your kids. Remind them all are equal before God. Number five, when it does arise, when a situation arises, when we see injustice or prejudice arise in word or action, whether you see it, or whether you hear it, address it, don't wait. Waiting and saying nothing speaks volumes and trust can so quickly be broken. Nathan was willing to be a servant of God and speak up. And he was obedient to God to speak to the highest earthly authority, no less. The king. You know, it isn't always easy to speak up. We may tend to shy back when we see an injustice. We may hope someone else will say something. We may ignore it and hope it doesn't come up again. Uh, we may be scared of the blowback on ourselves. But those are not legit reasons. Number six, get involved with racial reconciliation initiatives in the community. And this was an interesting one for me to think about. I'm not aware of, of anything currently organized in our community. And, and a Google search, I came up with, with nothing. Um, but the point is to be aware and willing to step up and be part of the solution. We also have to be on our guard regarding generalizations, for example. You know, as we've seen in the past, there will be police officers in the wrong and that needs to be dealt with. But that does not mean that every police officer is, is bad. You know, it's the same in other situations. I know of a man that was pranked by teenagers on a regular basis for a while and he became very untrusting of all teenagers. So it can happen on different levels in different ways, um, different situations. And we recognize that when trust is broken, it's hard to mend. So as God's people, we have to be committed for the long haul. We need to be the peacemakers we are called to be. Standing up for the forgotten or the mistreated. I can say one thing for certain. I would not want to be in the shoes of the police officer. I don't know where his head was then. I don't know where his head is now. But I would not want to be in his shoes. If I was, I'd be afraid. I would be overwhelmed with guilt. I would know that there is a day coming where I'd have to stand in front of a judge and receive my, my penalty. And a judgment will come. And people are advocating for a guilty verdict and a harsh penalty. And when that judgment comes, let's say it's a, a life sentence in prison. I, I don't know what it's going to be. But let's say it's a life sentence in prison. Who of you will volunteer to take his place in prison? Yeah, if he's guilty and receives his just penalty, who of you will pay the price for his sin? You may be thinking, why, why would I do that? You know, he deserves it. 
It's his consequences to receive. Which brings us to the communion table. Why would Jesus die for my sin? It was my consequence to receive. I deserve it. But the Bible says that God loved us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took our place. So I choose to put my faith in Jesus as my Redeemer. I choose to follow him. And my prayer, as the psalmist prayed in Psalm 139, verse 24, says, And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. May the Lord teach us. May the Lord reveal any wickedness in us and help us and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. We now come to the communion table. If you don't have something to represent the bread and the cup, you might want to pause the video or run for that right now very quick. We're going to be reading from, first of all, from Psalm 113. It says, Praise the Lord. Yes, give praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord now and forever. Everywhere, from east to west, praise the name of the Lord. For the Lord is high above the nations. His glory is higher than the heavens. Who can be compared with the Lord our God? Who is enthroned on high? He stoops to look down on heaven and on earth. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among princes, even the princes of his own people. He gives the childless woman a family, making her a happy mother. Praise the Lord. A reminder that as we come to the communion table that uh, God calls us, God chooses us, and he chooses from all nations, from the east, the west, the north, and the south. All are included. All are welcome to receive the grace and mercy through Jesus that he offers. Come to the Lord Jesus. And we come to the table now as those who realize and understand that Jesus is our own personal Savior, our own personal Redeemer, and we do so humbly and sincerely and with great joy as we remember all that God did for us. So on the night that he was betrayed, the night before his crucifixion, Jesus gathered his friends and his disciples around the table, and he took the bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we take this bread, we remember that he gave up his life for us. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we take this bread. Let it be a sign of all that you did for us and who you are to us. That this body has been broken for me. Thank you for this bread of life. Amen. And Jesus, and Jesus took the cup, he said this is the cup of, represents my blood, the new covenant, which is made for you. God. Would you pray with me? Jesus, as we drink this cup, help us to understand that this blood was poured out for us, that our sins could be washed away. Help us to understand all that you are to us and to me. And thank you that you bring us peace that passes understanding. Amen. And I'd like to say a closing prayer before we go. Jesus, through your death and resurrection, you reconciled the world to God. And through your example, you've shown us a way to peace. God, give us strength as your people of God. Help us to be channels to promote justice and peace in our world. Speaking your peace, living your peace. And always longing for that moment and that future of eternal peace that you have for us when we will see you again. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week. And if you can, join us for Wednesday study and prayer time. Lord bless you and keep you.